Now shall we turn to the word of God for this evening. We are studying on these Sunday evenings Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. First letter to the Thessalonians. Tonight we've reached chapter 2, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 17. But since we were bereft of you, brethren, for a short time, in person but not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's servant in the gospel of Christ, to establish you in your faith and to exhort you that no one be moved by these afflictions. You yourselves know that this is to be our lot. For when we were with you, we told you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent that I might know your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and that our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we've been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we render to God for you for all the joy which we feel for your sake before our God, praying earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all men as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. I don't know if you realize what a wonderful thing it was when Paul put pen to paper to write to the Thessalonians. Do you realize that this was the first, the very first part of the New Testament to be written? And Paul thought he was just writing a letter. That's all he thought. And this tiny little thing suddenly became so important it became part of God's word, just a personal letter. And you have no idea just how much God can use a little thing. Thank God that Paul wrote the letter. I'm so glad that most of the New Testament is in the form of epistles because letters are so much more personal. You see, most of the New Testament was almost written accidentally, humanly speaking, or incidentally, certainly. Just letters dashed off in a moment to a need. And in these letters there shines through the affection, the relationships that are formed in Jesus Christ which come to mean so much to us. Do you realize that 12 months before Paul did not know a single person at Thessalonica and now he's writing to them and saying, away from you I feel bereaved. It's an incredible demonstration of how deep relationships are given to us in Jesus Christ. New brothers and sisters, a new family to which we belong. And so real are these new relationships that I think most of you would agree that within a very short time of knowing Christ, you feel closer to your fellow Christians than to your own unconverted relatives. 
And in this passage I read the deep affection and love the heart throb of Paul shine through. I've been trying to decide this week whether Paul was an, an evangelist, a missionary, a pastor, a teacher, an elder, or what he was. And I've come to the conclusion he was the whole lot rolled into one. And that from him all of us can learn a very great deal about relationships with those we're seeking to help. Here is a spiritual father writing to his children. And I'm so glad that Paul is honest enough to say that sometimes he was in the depths of depression and anxiety about the work of God and other times he was on the top of a mountain so bubbling with joy he had just to put it down on paper. That gives me great encouragement. You know, we sometimes get the idea that the ideal Christian life is one that just stays beautifully even, has no ups and downs. Well, I don't find much of that in the New Testament. I don't even find it in the life of Jesus. There were times when Jesus wept and times when he just exulted in spirit and said, Great, I thank you, Father, that you're revealing things to babes and sucklings that are hidden from the wise. And so there are depths of anxiety in the Christian life and service and there are heights of joy and we're going to see just what causes this kind of emotional up and down and, and just how it's put right and how we can cope with it. Now I've divided the passage into four sections. It doesn't take a very clever preacher to do that but I've, I've given four words on the bulletin outline just to be pegs on which I want to hang the thoughts of each section. First of all Let's highlight the desire that Paul expresses in verses 17 to 20 of chapter 2. I want you to remember that he had to leave Thessalonica in a hurry and under cover of darkness. I wonder what you would feel if next Sunday you arrived and, and heard that I'd done a midnight flit on Tuesday. All sorts of rumors would go. People would say there's something he's running away from. All kinds of things would be thought. And Paul had had to do just that. The civic situation was so tense that it was decided by the leaders of that little church that they better get Paul out of there and get him out of there quietly and quickly. And so under cover of darkness, some of the brethren sent him off to Berea. And the next Sunday when they came together to worship, their leader had gone. Now some people probably said, well, he's a fly-by-night and... He doesn't really think much about us. But Paul writes and says, Listen, I want to tell you that even though I left you in body, my heart stayed with you. My heart's never left you. And indeed, when you've come into a spiritual family, when you've made brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't care where your body goes, your heart stays. And Paul's heart stayed there. He wasn't a man who was only interested in what happened while he was there and lost interest as soon as he'd gone. His heart stayed and he longed to see them. He wanted to be with them. And you notice he says, even though my heart stayed with you, I wanted my body to join my heart. I wanted to see your face. And there is a very real sense in which because we're in the flesh, because we're in the body, even if our heart may be with people, that's not enough. It's not satisfying. Our bodies must be where our hearts are. We want to see people's faces, shake them by the hands. We want to be in physical contact. It's not enough to be with someone in spirit. While we're human beings on earth, we long to be with people physically. And so Paul said, that's how I really feel about you. I may have gone in a hurry. I may have not said a proper goodbye to you. But my heart stayed and my body has just longed to get back. Now here's a man who really has a deep love for people. But he says, I couldn't get back because Satan stopped me coming. The intriguing thing is I, I would love Paul, you know, for just a quarter of an hour and ask him a few questions. I think it would be more than a quarter of an hour. The tragedy is that when I finally get him, I won't have any more questions. But one just so longs to ask Paul questions. I'd love to say, for example, how did Satan stop you getting back to them? Doesn't say. An even deeper question I would like to ask him is this. Look, Paul, there were times in your life when you were stopped going places and then you said it was the Holy Spirit stopped you. Now you're saying Satan stopped you. How do you know when it's which? Paul seemed to be so sure that he could say, the Holy Ghost forbade me to go to Bithynia. He hindered me from going into Asia. But now he says, Satan hinders me from going to Thessalonica. Now, how did he know? 
Because sometimes I'm stopped doing something and I don't know whether it's the Lord or, or the devil or who. And I'd love to just put Paul in the hot seat and say, how do you know? The one thing we can be certain of is this. He was quite sure when it was Satan stopping him. He was absolutely sure when it was the old devil putting a blockage. Literally, he says, Satan put a roadblock in my path and I couldn't get through to you. Shall I tell you why Satan does this? I don't know how he was doing it and I don't know how Paul knew he was doing it, but I do know why he did it. If Satan can keep Christians apart, he will. And if Satan can keep teacher and pupil apart, he will. And if Satan can keep someone who can meet the spiritual needs of a group of Christians away from them, he will. And he'll do anything at all. So I don't know if Satan was causing Paul's sickness or whether Satan was causing people to oppose his passage through the frontier from one section of Greece to another. I don't know how he was doing it, but I know why. And if Satan can separate Christians from one another when they could be building each other up, he'll do so. Well now, Paul has a double desire. He says, I want to be present with you on earth and I want to be proud of you in heaven. Now there's one reunion of Christians that Satan will never be able to stop. Hallelujah. He may stop me meeting a Christian on earth, but he can't stop me meeting him in heaven. And the reunion to which Paul now looks forward, he's saying, look, even if Satan keeps me away from you for the rest of my life, I'll meet you there. And he can't interfere with that. I remember again our pastor friend be behind the Iron Curtain when I said to him, I, I do hope that you'll be able to come and visit Guildford. He said, well, they've taken away my passport and they won't reconsider it for another three years. And I said, well, well will you come then in three years' time to Guildford? We'd love to have you there. And he just said with a smile, I might be in heaven before then and they don't need to give me a visa to get there. And, and the man was free. The man was looking forward to the one meeting of Christians that Satan can do nothing about. He may stop us being present with each other on earth, but he can't stop us meeting the Lord in the air when the Lord comes back. And Paul says, I want not only to be present with you on earth, I want to be proud of you on that day. And now Paul just bursts. He says, you are our hope. You're our joy. You're our glory. You're our crown. And the word he uses for crown, we would say a gold medal. It's the laurel wreath used for the races in, in those days. And he says, when I meet Jesus, I'm going to say, Jesus, these people are my crown. My crowning achievement, if you like. When you face Jesus, what will be your crown? What will be your glory? I tell you this, there are many things that people are putting their hopes in now which when they meet Jesus will not be their hope. There are many things that people glory in now which you will not glory in that day. You may have passed all your O-levels and A-levels. You may have built up a, a big business. You may have, have, have got the house that you just wanted. I tell you, they will not be your glory in that day. In that day, your glory will be the number of people you've brought nearer to Christ. It's as simple as that. They are your hope of being proud on that day. They will be your joy on that day. They will be your glory. And there is a legitimate pride. And oh, how proud, how bursting you will feel with the right kind of pride if you can face Jesus in that day and say, You see these people? I help to bring them to you, Lord. And so Paul, with a legitimate pride, says of the Thessalonians, you are my joy, you are my glory, and when I get to glory, when I meet Jesus face to face, I just want to show him you. And he uses a very interesting word for the coming of our Lord Jesus. It's the first time the word is ever used so far as we know of the coming of Christ, it's a Greek word that means a royal visit. A royal visit. You know, if Queen Elizabeth II was coming here, oh, I'd be so proud to show you to her. <laughs> I'd say, this is the family. This is Millmead. Not the building. These are the people. This is the church. But it's when we stand before the Lord that our hope and glory will be those we have led nearer to Christ. 
Well, now that's Paul's heart, his ambition, his desire. What is his deepest desire? What pleases him most? What would he like to do most? And the answer is to be present with Christians on earth and to be proud of them in heaven. If you have that same desire, then you will understand the rest of the letter. So let's look secondly at verses 1 to 5, Paul's doubt, his anxiety, a, an anxiety that got him so depressed that he said, I got to the point where I could bear it no longer. Now what anxiety could get Paul as low as that? He was really down. He'd moved on from Thessalonica to Berea. He'd gone further and further south. Now he was in Athens in that pagan place. And, and I thought of Athens when, when Sam Chetty was just talking earlier in the service about the, the intellectual areas, the pessimistic intellectual areas that you get in great universities and how you feel in a sense at first embarrassed to be coming with a simple gospel of Jesus Christ into that field. How you feel alone. How am I going to tackle these great brains? How am I going to get into this world? And Paul felt like that at Athens and he had with him an interesting companion a rather timid, shy young man with delicate health, just the opposite of Paul, temperamentally and physically and every way, Paul and Timothy, most unusual companions, and yet between them was a deep bond. They relied heavily on each other, and the Lord means us not to try it alone, but to have someone we can rely on. And Paul and Timothy came to Athens, and in face of all this intellectualism and this antagonism and this paganism, they clung to each other for support. But Paul had a greater anxiety than how to meet the needs of Athens. His anxiety was, what is happening at Thessalonica? I know they're going through it. How are they standing up to it? They say no news is good news. I don't think that's true. I think even the worst news is better than no news. I found that out with patients. Doctors will tell you that to tell a patient nothing is worse than telling them the worst. They can cope with bad news if it's told. But no news is horrible, the strain of silence. And Paul had to bear this and he said, how are they getting on? You see, here's an evangelist who isn't just interested in how many people start the Christian life, but how they stand and what they're doing 12 months later and how they're coping with opposition and persecution. And so, bless him, Paul said, I was prepared to remain all alone and send Timothy to find out. I could bear it no longer. I just had to find, find out what was happening. The two things he was worried about were these. First, that they would be discouraged by distress. He had warned them, thank God for honest preachers. Thank God for honest evangelists who say, you come to Christ and you'll suffer. You come to Christ and your troubles will begin. You come to Christ and you're in for a very tough time. Thank God for evangelists who say that. And Paul says in Thessalonica, I told you repeatedly again and again that through much tribulation you'll enter the kingdom. It'll be big trouble. I warned you that this was coming, but you know, it's one thing to know it in your head. It's another thing to have it happen to you. It's one thing to be told. It's another thing to live it. And I warn you, though in a lesser degree in this Christianized land, I warn you still that for every Christian, life is going to be a battle until they cross to the other side. It's tough to be a Christian in this world because it's not a Christian world and it doesn't belong. You don't belong. It belongs to Satan, the prince of this world, the God of this world. It really belongs to God ultimately, but Satan's got hold of it. And so for the Christian, it's going to be tough. And Paul said it repeatedly, and they'd heard it, but now he knew it was happening. And his anxiety was, how will they stand up when the going gets tough? I've talked to many new Christians, and I've discovered that the honeymoon lasts, on average, two to three months. And that for two to three months, you kind of ride on a cloud, and you think you're in for a comfortable ride to glory. And then uh, between the end of the second and the beginning of the fourth month, somewhere in that third month, you just go bang. Don't know if you remember when that happened to you. Don't know if you remember your first real tough time. And perhaps the opposition came from the most unexpected quarter. It's tough to be a Christian. And Paul thinks, how are they getting on? Are they standing 
And the other thing that he's worried about is this. Not only will human opposition come and human problems of relationships, but behind all that, there is someone who can exploit that situation to the full and he's afraid that they are also being tempted by the tempter. After all, Satan is winning on Paul's side. Satan has prevented him going again and again. Satan is winning on Paul's side and Paul is desperately anxious. If Satan is keeping me away from them and, and winning on my side, is he winning on their side too? And he said, I was so anxious that you were being tempted by the tempter. And the trouble is when there's opposition and the going gets tough, Satan whispers horrible things in your ear. He says, it's not worth it. He said, you didn't think it was going to be as bad as this, did you? Well, of course, it's your own silly fault. You, you started being a Christian and he whispers away to you and the tempter tempts and he can exploit that kind of situation. Well, now, Paul was a very good evangelist, so he had to find out he was not content to leave them. Now, thirdly, his delight, verses 6 to 9. Do you know there's nothing more encouraging to a Christian worker than to know that someone he started off is still going? It really is one of the greatest thrills. We had three years in the Royal Air Force, and you know, one of the greatest thrills to me is still right this year, indeed this summer, to be meeting people in the RAF whom we saw start off as baby Christians there and to know that they're going on. What a joy to know it lasts, to know they've stood firm, even though they've had it tough. The tempter hasn't got hold of them. God has got hold of them even more firmly because it's been tough. It's a tremendous encouragement to Christian workers and I would just ask you this simple question. Think of the person who was most instrumental in leading you to the Lord. Would your present spiritual state be a source of joy and delight to them? Have you ever thought that way? Have you ever thought of writing and telling them how you're getting on? The only time that the word gospel is used for anything other than the good news about Jesus Christ is in this passage and Paul says, Timothy came back with a gospel for me, a good news for me. And the great news was that your faith and your love were as strong as ever and that you missed me as much as I did you and that you want to see me as much as I want to see you. And Paul says, we now live. You've put new life into us to know that you're going on, to know that you're standing firm. And this really does put new life into people. You see, Christian workers, if uh, you're not careful, hear most about those who don't go on. We hear about the problems, the backsliders, those who are getting into difficulties. And sometimes, and we've had a week of it like that this week, if I'm very frank with you, a week of hearing of those who've got into problems and those who are backsliding and those who are getting into difficulties. There are a few things lower the morale of Christian workers so quickly or get them down so quickly. But when you hear of another who's gone on, who's standing and who's developing in faith and love, oh, it puts new life into you. You feel, right, let's go out for another. Let's go after someone else. It's, it's all worthwhile to know that your children stand firm in the faith. It strengthens you for living you see, the faithfulness of his converts was a matter of life and death to Paul. He says, I was dying in spirit because I heard nothing of you. Now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. It's life to us to know this. And then he bursts out into thanksgiving, giving glory where glory is due. He hardly can find the words for the Lord. And he just pours out thanksgiving and says, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. This letter must have been written as soon as Timothy got back because it's just bursting. If you read it in a modern translation, you'll get the emotions of it even more. After months of anxiety, it's all right. They, they're going on. They're as strong as ever. And so his delight at it, his joy, is just very obvious. May I suggest that a very practical outworking of this evening's service might be that you get in touch with the person who led you to the Lord and tell them, I'm going on. I'm going on. You might just put new life into them. You might just help them to go on themselves. Now the fourth thing, the last thing I want to talk about tonight, 
Paul's dissatisfaction. Now you'd have thought with all that good news, he'd have been so thrilled. He'd have said, great, I can cross them off my prayer list. Great, I, ca I can stop thinking about them. I can get on with Athens now and Corinth and all the rest. That's marvelous. I'll leave them to it. They're going on well. Not so. Paul was a man who was never content with less than the best. Never content until people had all that God had for them. And so he said, you know what I'm doing? This great news that Timothy has brought will make me pray for two things. I'm going to pray even more that I may come to you. I just want to see this. And I'm going to pray that I may be able to make up what is lacking in your faith. I want even more for you than you've got if you're going on well. Now that's a strange reaction. He's not satisfied with the good news. He still wants more. First he prayed that he might be able to see them. And you know that prayer was answered five years later. Are you prepared to pray for a thing five years? He had to pray for five years until the power of God broke down Satan's obstacles and he got through to Thessalonica. Five years. But he got through and his prayer was answered and he met them again on earth. And so look... Do you realize this congregation here tonight will never meet again on earth? Never. This congregation as it is right now will never meet again on earth. Be lovely too, but we won't. But I tell you this, we'll meet in glory. But it's nice to meet again on earth, isn't it? Lovely. And I hope that all of us will have a chance of meeting again. I hope I'll meet Sam Chetty again on earth. If I don't, see you up there, Sam. But be lovely too. And, and so Paul prayed, and it took five years before he saw those folk again, but his prayer was answered. His other prayer was a, an intriguing one. The, the, the word he uses for making up what is lacking is a word that a fisherman uses for mending nets when there's a gash or a tear in a net. And I want to make a horrible pun now, which I think you may remember, and it's this. There are two sorts of Christians... And the difference between them is one letter. They are both holy, and one is spelled H-O-L-E-Y, and the other is spelled H-O-L-Y. And Paul says, I want to fill the holes in your faith. I want to mend the holes. I want you to be complete in faith. I want you to have everything that God has for you. And so, Paul says, you're still holy Christians, H-O-L-E-Y. And there are still gaps in your experience. What were those gaps? We shall find some of them next Sunday night. They're surprising gaps. They're things we wouldn't have thought would need to be said in a Christian fellowship, but they do. And we shall study that next Sunday evening. But Paul says, I want you to be holy. H-O-L-Y. Unblameable in holiness. Too many of us are holy Christians. There are gaps showing and Paul says, I want to close the gaps, mend the nets, repair what is lacking in your faith until you are a complete person. Because the word holy in English comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word, halig, H-A-L-I-G, which means whole, complete. So there's nothing lacking, that everything's there. I think we've all sort of taken watches to bits in our youth and then put them all together again and found ourselves with two cogwheels left over and thought, well, where do they go? And wondered why the watch doesn't work properly. And in a sense, God wants to restore the mechanism. He wants to make us go. He wants to make us work properly. And so he wants to get every part in. He wants to get the Christian complete. He wants a holy man who is increasing in love and abounding in love. Those two words Paul uses means increasing within us and overflowing out of us. And a holy person is someone who has so increased that he overflows. It's a positive picture of holiness, not negative. It's of someone who's just increasing in these things and overflowing in these things. So Paul prays for that. And once again, he gets back to the main subject of the two letters to the Thessalonians, the royal visit of Jesus. He says, I want you to be unblameable in holiness at the coming of our Lord Jesus. I'm preaching rather shorter than usual tonight, but I'm going to finish by tying those two ends together. He 
said there are two things that a Christian needs if they're going to welcome our Lord's coming. One is that they come with hope in others whom they've brought to Christ. And the second is that they come with holiness in themselves. These are the two things that will get you ready for the Lord's return as a Christian. And if you are able to say when the Lord comes back and he says, well, what have you done on earth? And you're able to, to point to other people as your hope and say, Lord, I help to bring these to yourself. These are my crown. These are my reward. These are my joy. And if you're able to point yourself as to a net without a single hole, as a whole Christian, as unblameable in holiness, then believe me, Jesus will look on your face and say with a smile, well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Do you want to be ready for the Lord's coming? Doesn't it put it in a different perspective? Doesn't it make you look at all the things you do in a different light? Doesn't it make you alter your scale of values? These are the two things you'll need to face him properly. Other people and yourself. Other people brought to him and yourself fit to meet him. And if I've been speaking tonight to Christians, let me add one word. For those who are not Christians... Until you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't even meet him at his coming. One day you will, but you will meet him as judge, but you won't meet him with joy. Let us pray. Father, we do want to thank you that when we became your sons and daughters, you put us in a family, you gave us relationships that mean so much to us. And we long to be with each other in body as well as in the heart. And we praise you for these links of love that you have created. And we thank you that through those links we minister to each other and build each other up. Lord, we pray that every one of us who names your name may be ready for when you come. That when we look into your lovely face, you look into our lives we may be able to present holiness in ourselves and the joy of having around us those whom we help to bring. Lord, grant us those two things. Make their am our ambition and in all our desires for fellowship one with one another, give us a divine dissatisfaction until these two things are ours. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen. Hymn number 189. 189. Our Lord is now rejected by the world disowned, by the many still neglected and by the few enthroned. But soon he'll come in glory. The hour is drawing nigh for the crowning day is coming by and by. Let all that look for hasten the coming joyful day by earnest consecration to walk the narrow way by gathering in the lost ones for whom our Lord did die for the crowning day that's coming by and by the royal visit 189